Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation in virtual mode. We've been looking at the same sorts of issues in a virtual format that we were looking at in the real world before lockdown hit. One of those issues is obviously housing, housing finance. Housing finance is a huge issue in the UK, uh, and it has become even more so as a result of the COVID crisis. Where is the housing sector going? What are the problems? What are the potential solutions? We have a very distinguished panel to talk about these. Yolanda Barnes is professor and chair of the Bartlett a real Estate Institute at UCL, University College London. She's a former director of world research at Savile. I love that, world research. Uh, on her website, it says, and I quote, my job is thinking things about real estate that most people in the industry aren't thinking yet. So uh, she is, our, as it were, kickoff speaker. She's also a non-executive at uh, Space Syntax, which I guess is an urban planning cons uh, consultancy. David Simmons, MP, is the Tory MP for Rice Ricelip, Northwood and Pinner, which he, uh, he won the seat last year. He's also a councillor for Hillingdon. Uh, he's the chair of the all-party parliamentary group on housing and planning. Um, which is important as a format for discussing issues arising from the whole planning and housing process. Piers Williamson is chief executive at the Housing Finance Corporation, which he joined as long ago as 2002, as deputy, initially as deputy CEO. Uh, the Housing Finance Corporation, which you may well know, is a specialist mutual finance company that lends long-term institutional funding to UK registered housing associations. He is, as it were, a refugee from the city. He began at NatWest, moved to Climort Benson, uh, where he was securing, securitizing residential mortgages. So we can blame him for lots of things. He became treasurer of HFC Bank and then fled to the safety of the Housing Finance Corporation. And Les Mayhew is a professor of statistics at what used to be called Cass Business School, which has now had to change its name to The Business School. Uh, he's an honor honorary fellow of the Institute of Actuaries, a member of the Royal Economics Society. He's also managing director at Mayhew Harper Associates and is the author of a couple of CSFI reports, in particular, Housing for an Aging Population. And my colleague, Jane Fuller, uh, who has been doing a bit of mugging up on this, I'm going to give her the floor first because she can sort of set, set the stage for what she hopes will come out of this discussion. Jane, Jane Fuller. Thank you. Um, well, it, as it's important to have some focus to this conversation, and I'm hoping that we will not talk about house prices, which is, of course, what uh, the UK people tend to obsess about. Um, but instead, perhaps more about uh, policy goals and the composition of the UK housing stock. So we, we have this ambitious target of 300,000 houses to be built a year. Um, one would hope that perhaps there's been a slightly less embarrassing shortfall in, in not reaching that target in, finally in recent years. Um, so there's an issue of how to get that done, but it's not just a numbers game. Um, uh, you know, as some of the speakers will, 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 will say, um, there's an issue of affordability. Uh, there's also an issue as, as to whether the housing stock is suitable for an aging population. In, supplying sufficient small units for one and one and two people households as opposed to family units. Um, and then there's the whole uh, maelstrom really of planning, which has been a bugbear in the UK for many, many years. There's been some attempts to make the whole planning process more streamlined. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, whether that's finally happening. And there's a very interesting bit of COVID context to that in the sense that um, if we are having big changes in the high street through uh, retailers going bust or pubs going bust, vacant space in places where presumably people want to live and which definitely isn't green belt. You know, what's the prospects for sort of rapid change of use to help solve the uh, any housing shortages? And there's also an issue to do with concentration in the building industry, whether there's too few big builders which um, who may or may not want to build out uh, permissioned land as quickly as we would like them to. And there's also, um, should is this something that the uh, private 
sector can sort out? Or is there an increasing role again, as many of us will remember, for the public sector in building houses and indeed, as peers will represent, for the third sector in building houses? So lots to go at, absent house prices. Okay, lots and lots of questions. You can pick and choose which ones you choose to answer. I give you Yolanda Barnes. Yolanda. Gosh, well, I'm, I'm going to start uh, with the immediate and short term and uh, maybe go on to uh, the longer term and more global sort of observations. Um, COVID, I think, has fundamentally changed the nature of demand for housing. Um, but in ways that were probably uh, already in train. Um, I think we can see that, uh, if you like, what we mean by housing has become much more than housing. I think of immense importance now is not, uh, as it were, the four walls that people live within, but the neighbourhood that they're in. And to give it a COVID characterization, I'd say uh, people want neighborhoods where you can sing to your neighbors or maybe hear birds sing, uh, rather than having to yell across vast empty spaces between tall buildings. And there's quite a lot of evidence emerging of the sort of places that have proved almost unlivable uh, during uh, lockdown and those which have thrived and survived. And I think to touch on house prices, the inflation we're seeing uh, or supposedly seeing in the UK at the moment, and indeed is being seen elsewhere, is a result of this change in demand, new demand for places that were rel in relatively low demand before, but are now high demand, um, uh, coupled with the fact that um, hidden from view, because there are no transactions, are places that will in future prove to be almost unsaleable, I suspect. So, um, I think we've got to start thinking about housing in a new and different form. Um, and the most obvious of, of those is uh, with people working from home, what we require of, of our buildings is changed. Now, I'm, I'm not pretending the, that the end of this central business district and the office uh, is nigh, but I do think that we're going to be working uh, probably in three different places. We've, we've effectively tripled demand for workspace, once in the home, once in the CBD, and probably increasingly in what you might call local soft hubs. So again, this points to the importance of neighbourhood and the importance of high quality neighbourhoods with multi-uses um, and uh, the potential for formerly left behind places to become these sort of thriving neighbourhoods, as it were, uh, which in turn sets great challenges, I think, for the planning system and the need for planning to, if you like, accommodate what you might call sui generis use, a much more multiple, uh, flex flexible hour by hour or day by day uh, sort of use for all sorts of uh, different human activities that make up our neighbourhoods. Um, all of this um, can be sort of uh, cloaked in post-COVID sort of metaphors, but actually many of these trends, the emphasis on neighbourhoods, the move towards polycentric, multi-centred, uh, multi dispersed um, cities, and uh, the use of digital technology was all on the cards before COVID struck. And I think we've just, as it were, accelerated the future by, say, 20 years or so. Um, I think it's therefore really important to concentrate on that future and what 21st century real estate is in comparison to uh, 20th century real estate, and particularly with regards to finance. I think we were fast approaching a time when all asset values were going to be on a high plateau simply as a result of the immense yield shifts, downward yield shifts that have happened as interest rates uh, have become lower uh, and inflation interest rates are low and stable. I think you can expect asset values, including housing, but also all sorts of other types of real estate and indeed stocks, bonds, etc., to be on a high, i.e. expensive, but stable plateau. And that has really important implications for valuers, because uh, in my view, there's no longer the inbuilt asset inflation that we've grown used to over the last 30 or so years. Um, and that uh, is going to catch out um, home improvers, uh, refurbishers, and developers alike, potentially. Um, so 
coming into our uh, dictionary, as it were, of real estate should increasingly be the words obsolescence and depreciation. And if you want evidence of what happens in a low inflation, low interest rate economy, just look at the last 20 or 30 years in Japan. Uh, obsolescence and depreciation is something they are absolutely expert at. Uh, that's not to say it's killed all development activity or um, investment activity in the real estate sector, far from it. But uh, the emphasis is very much more on income and net income streams. And that's where um, the social housing and third sector, I think, have an immense uh, advantage in understanding those net income streams. And dare I say, I think what um, uh, social housing providers and uh, housing associations have become used to over the last uh, 30 years or so now um, will be become the norm, not just in residential, but in all sorts of other types of finance and investment. I suspect, in other words, the value of buildings uh, is coming to be the, their capability to generate future uh, strong, stable net income cash flows. Um, and I, I think probably having sort of thrown uh, a whole whole set of sort of new and different thoughts at you, I, pro I should probably leave it there for, for discussion. But uh, that's the way we're thinking about real estate. At the okay, moment. I think it's really interesting that the one thing you haven't said is that we need more houses. I mean, is that no longer the dominant issue? Because that has been the dominant issue, at least as far as I'm concerned, politically and in the popular press for the, as long as I can remember, build more. Yeah, I think I think we're obsessed with unit numbers uh, to the detriment of what really matters, and that is um, the quality and availability of decent housing in good neighbourhoods. And what I'm saying, uh, I suppose, is that um, I suppose it hidden it, it hidden in my comments there the fact that. Um, some of those unit numbers, those buildings that we've produced in the the, the bid for uh, numbers of units are actually in singularly inadequate to the needs of the 21st century to accommodate um, that. In other words, the, the, the neighbourhoods they've created, um, whether they be sort of single, well, any, any kind of homogenous housing, uh, whether it be little boxes on housing estates or tall tall boxes in cities, tend to produce suboptimal uh, neighbourhoods. And the evidence from the COVID lockdown is that um, some of those new environments have been particularly inadequate to the challenges of lockdown. Um, and so, if we if we Yes, supply, if we think about the supply of good neighbourhoods and livable, usable, productive neighbourhoods, not just housing units, uh, then supply matters. But I think it would be um, a sort of a false, uh, well, a, a, an inadequate sort of pursuit, but also a, a potentially even counterproductive pursuit just to go after unit numbers. Mm -hmm. And certainly won't make a difference to if, if we if we don't supply, you know, basically the, the houses with gardens or, or or apartments with allotments in a good neighborhood that people want. It won't shift the supply uh, uh, demand imbalance at all. So we want quality rather than quantity just at the moment. David is uh, as a politician and as a, as a, a local councillor as well, um, living this, I guess, day to day. What's your view? I started out my political career uh, at the bottom of the local government food chain as chairman of a planning committee many, many years ago. <laughs> but one of the benefits of having had that starting point is that I do still today uh, live with the consequences of the decisions that I took in the community around me. And uh, I think that's probably a good starting point with the question about when we come to housing, is it something that is purely a function of a market or does it have uh, a wider purpose and it, the, the comments that we've just heard about unit numbers um, are, are a helpful starting point for that question because clearly you know, the state decided many many years ago that it had a significant role in housing both uh, through the planning system control of what was built and where it was built but also at a national level through the development of state-funded housing council housing 
uh, a more likely um, social housing to fill that gap in order to provide people with the homes that they need. But I think the, the debate that we're having now needs to be a much more sophisticated one than we've had in the past. And it's helpful, in my view, that we now have a government with a comfortable working majority because it means that that debate can take place against the backdrop of a, a situation where people are thinking about what kind of policy foundations we need to lay for the medium to long term, as opposed to having to think quite so much about the survival of the government over a very, very short period, and therefore the potentially controversial aspects of decisions that may be, may be taken. So one of the things we're discussing at the APPG is the question not just of what are the numbers, which I think is quite a sterile discussion, but what is it that we need in terms of homes for people? And what is it that we need in terms of the placemaking role that those numbers have? And it's starting with the, the question about what it is we need in terms of homes itself. And it's my observation from a local government background that when you are going to develop new social homes in a given area, um, if those homes are, for example, sheltered accommodation uh, or supported living, uh, especially of the kind that will enable people who are currently under occupying an existing uh, local housing stock to remain in their, their area, but, but releasing those units to, to families that may need uh, the, more, the more space that they provide, then that is something which is much more politically acceptable um, and is easier to get through in planning terms. And so you know, I think that's, that's a significant consideration for us. We need to look at not just what are the new units that we're trying to create in, in absolute numbers, but what contribution do they make to freeing up existing stock that might be made available to people, for example, who are on housing waiting lists. And the, the point, which, which again has been touched on, what does all of this contribute to the kind of place that we want to build. I'm a, both a member of parliament and a councillor in London. And we know that London is the largest city in Europe by, by land area. It's I believe one of the largest capitals in the world by land area, because it certainly is characterised by urban and then suburban sprawl. Uh, do we need a higher degree of density? Do we need to see more garden cities being built? And if so, what sacrifices are we willing to make in terms of green belt to achieve that? And what are the characteristics of the communities that we need to create? And is that something which the market can be left to determine? Um, do we think that the, the traditional executive home with the garage and the driveway space is the thing that, that Britain needs for the future? Um, or do we need to have a, a much greater variety? And I think that links back to the question about the development in particular of things like extra care, supported living, to enable people who would say, I would downsize from the home that I'm currently in if only I could stay in my local community where I've lived all my life, what is the accommodation that we need to be looking at on the, in, in town centres and in the fringes of our suburbs to enable that to happen? Um, so let me just move on then to, to two things that are really connected back then to the finances. So the first one is, is about the nature of tenure and the place that we give within that overall, let's say for the moment it's 300,000 uh, as an objective, within that to an allocation that's specifically about different types of social housing. And there's a lot of debates that go on about, um, firstly, you know, build to rent, the, the types of shared ownership, different types of social housing in the more traditional sense, but also um, the discussion about whether, uh, as is currently the case in the planning system, we need to predetermine a number of units that need to be delivered for a, a social purpose. And the challenge that we're seeing with that is that the way the planning system operates is that a developer gets consent for a site, and then goes down the affordability route and says, well, we simply cannot afford to build out the development at all um, unless we remove the social housing element from it. And particularly the interaction that this will have with the new uh, SIL, um, what that means in terms of yields nationally for social housing purposes isn't clear, but it is likely that it will bear down upon that. And when we are, we're realistic about what actually happens as opposed to what the, the policy and the strategy tell us we think should be happening. What we often see is the development of those sites, um, often significant proportion of those units sold to investors who then rent them back to people who are accessing market properties for a social housing purpose. So the rent ends up being paid by a local authority, typically to house a homeless family, but they're renting it from a private landlord as opposed to renting it from themselves or from a, a social housing provider. And 
we need to ask the question, I think, is having a system where we seek to determine the apportionment of units through the planning system in advance of development the way forward when it comes to yielding the quantity and type of social housing that we need? Or are we much better off doing what many local authorities are already doing, simply saying that things like right to buy receipts will be used to purchase those properties on the market in order to put them back into that, that social rented use? Or indeed, we simply negotiate uh, a different financial model of that relationship as opposed to the developer having a section 106 or similar agreement in advance, that it is done um, through some sort of market negotiation later on. <clears throat> and I think that leads me on to, to my final point, which is uh, both a note of caution, but something which I think we have an opportunity to look at. That clearly the, the success of the Everyone In programme to get homeless people off the streets and um, because of COVID has led to a good deal of interest in the financial markets in uh, financial instruments connected to social housing. Um, so we've seen a, a couple of uh, investment funds out on the, on the markets looking to raise money um, successfully, as I understand it, with a view specifically to investing in this type of housing and more broadly in the social housing field. Now, I, I think it would be tempting if you are sat in Treasury to see this as a a uh, very welcome addition to the market in that those are often organisations that would say they're more agile than traditional social housing providers. The, the challenge, and I, I say this having come up from the local authority background, therefore having seen both the supply and the demand side of this particular market, is that firstly that those people are clearly seeking a, a good financial return. And the risk is that what happens in practice is that they end up bidding against the existing social providers for a given unit. So that if you are a, a developer who is looking to build a, a new block in Westminster, you may well have Westminster City Council or whoever it is coming along saying, you know, we're looking to, to take that on to provide homeless accommodation. And you then have these investment funds bidding against them and therefore pushing up the price for everybody. So I think that's the first concern that I, I would have about that that we need to be mindful of. And if we look across to what this type of investment operate, operation has had, the effect it's had in adult social care, children's social care, um, it does create some significant um, risks around particularly the statutory duties that local authorities have. Uh, and I think in particular of what happens when um, potentially there is either a, a localised monopoly on that kind of uh, provision in a particular place. Because we know one of the reasons why those investors are interested in this is because there is a national shortage. So therefore, they're pretty much guaranteed to make money out of it. So the risk is that instead of this leading to additional units, what it yields is greater profitability on each individual unit, and that profitability is derived ultimately from the taxpayer who's paying for the cost of the, the unit to be provided for the person who needs it for that social purpose. And clearly, if that is the case, that is taking a resource which could otherwise provide for a greater group of people. And you know, purely as, as a politician whose job is to champion the interests of taxpayers, I don't think we should be looking to, to have a situation where we replicate what's happened, for example, in children's homes when adult social care homes, where you have quite complex financial structures that are leading to very, very significant profits that are, are being siphoned off by investors, um, which do not lead to any increase in the quality of the experience, either for the resident or the service user. Uh, and they do lead to very significantly increased costs to the taxpayers, again, for no additionality. So I think that's a really serious concern. So we need to be very, very mindful, I think, of what the the entry of those providers and those investment funds into the market will mean um, for the provision of that service and the cost it has to taxpayers. So I hope that, that provides a, a bit of a um, high level tour of where the APPG is at. Uh, and I'll hand back to you, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. I, I think many of the things that you say are really interesting. Um, but can I, I mean, do you feel that in an environment of ultra low interest rates and much higher spending on infrastructure, uh, this particular government is going to take a shall we say, more aggressive, more open view of uh, its own housing housing construction programme? Is, is there likely to be a sort of sea change in how a Conservative government views council housing, for instance? Uh, the sea change, in my view, came last year with the removing of the, the cap on HRA borrowing, which for a local authority does enable it to have a, a lot more headroom in, in terms of borrowing um, to fund that capital investment. Now, not every local authority has a housing revenue account, which it can tap, but the vast majority do. And the vast majority of those are very well resourced indeed to finance that. So 
it makes it makes very good sense and is, is potentially a very big opportunity to bring into the marketplace um, a, a lot more finance that would enable traditional council housing or partnership with social housing providers to be to be delivered. I think the, the bigger challenge is making sure that when we are, we're very reliant upon the market to make that happen at the moment, the market traditionally has not responded in a way that would imperil its profit margins. And, and we have to ask the question, therefore, can we be confident if we have the social purpose, that is to make sure that there is both greater ownership of homes and also greater provision of the different types of social tenure available, that, that we will be able to intervene directly or through reliable third parties to make sure that that is delivered. Of course, Croydon with brick by brick didn't do terribly well on social housing, and but that's a labour that's a labour council. Thing. I, I wouldn't criticise wouldn't criticise Croydon for that, or, or indeed the, the fact of their their politics. An interesting question with with brick by brick. I mean, the council has lent them directly a very very large amount of money, at several hundreds of millions. Um, it is likely, in due course, if competently managed, that the the, the, s- the service that they've entered into will provide an extremely good return. I think the, the big challenge which local authorities have in this field, which is where I think there is a question about government involvement, is that they have to balance their budget in year. So when Croydon, as is the case here, has hit a cash flow problem because of COVID, um, their budget doesn't balance anymore and it precipitates a crisis. Um, in much the same way, if you said to central government that the, the £400 billion pound or whatever it is now cost of COVID all had to be paid off in this financial year, well, we'd be in big, big trouble. Government's looking at 50-year bonds probably to pay off that, a bit like the Second World War. Um, so, you know, the question is how how best we enable local authorities to do it. And, and the fact that you can capitalise those costs in the HRA does provide flexibility that doesn't exist if that borrowing was done in the general fund, which I think was part of the problem in Croydon, that they, because they did it commercially, they borrowed it in the general fund, which means that they don't have the same flexibility. Okay. Uh, Piers, um, how do you respond to, to that? I mean, you represent always, a large uh, chunk of the future, as far as I can yeah. see. Piers Williams. Um, Andrew, we've already had a bewildering array of um, kind of point, points made. Quite a lot of them are focused implicitly or explicitly towards the new build market. I just wanted to make one COVID, um, I suppose, specific comment about the existing market and it it draws from one of my favorite formative books when i came to the sector was um uh, david two brains willits wrote a book called the pinch uh, and in it there's a chapter about polish plumbers i think i'm probably going to go into non-politically correct stuff but it was it was essentially why can't you get more than two plumbers from liverpool um to to come down to london whereas you can get uh, a bed in a shed with 10 Polish plumbers or what, what, whatever the equivalent is, because they put up with rubbish housing standards. When you roll that sort of idea forward to COVID, and um, David, um, Hillingdon, I suspect, has got more than its fair share of beds and sheds, and it's, 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 a, it's an endemic problem around whole chunks of London. You get back to this sort of Dickensian idea of health standards, basically. Why is, why is COVID spreading so quickly? Um, and there's another manifestation of this, or going back to Ian Duncan Smith and, and universal credit and, and some of the measures that were taken alongside universal credit. We had something called the spare room subsidy only, whatever it was, seven, eight years ago, to try and, ration, to try and use our scarce housing stock more efficiently. But magically, COVID has turned us all into wanting home offices and some of the worst standards are for some of the youngest people with the least space where they're trying to work on their, their bed in their, you know, their, their apartment that's supposed to be for four people, they've got six people in it. So there, there are some sustainability issues about the use of our existing stock that are really, they're, they're really being amplified during COVID. So I didn't want those points to escape. I just wanted to make probably three or four points about the market as we are now in, in new build. In, Certainly in my market, um, after the Grenfell tragedy, we've had uh, a lot of housing organisations doing intrusive surveying of taller buildings. And surprise, surprise, they're finding some of the other defects that have actually been hidden in these buildings for 10 or 20 years. 
And I think we're at the start of a phenomenon that is probably around complicated apartment buildings, or it's concentrated there, and a lot of it is concentrated in London, where there is an enormous remediation bill. And people talk about cladding, and it's very important that we solve the, the cladding issue, but actually it goes a lot further than that. There was a, a fire in um, a four-story wooden, wooden frame block of flats uh, in Worcester Park, it was, I think it was covered by the Sunday Times two or three weeks ago. Um, it's called Richmond House. And that burnt down in 11 minutes flat, start to finish. It wasn't clad in anything. There are lots of wooden frame buildings all around, all around the country, lots of that archetype. Fundamentally, there weren't any fire breaks in between the floors, which is why it kind of burnt down quickly. And we've got a, a bit of a quiet, you know, quiet tsunami, a, a, a wave of litig litigation flowing through the market and the blame game going on. And, and that is going to cost someone a lot of money. It's going to cost someone a lot of money for five or 10, five or ten years. Um, so that itself is going to crowd out new supply, I think. You can only spend the cash once. So that's number one. Then if you look at EPCC, which is the grade that I think most um, new build will have to to uh, be at by 2030. And just in my sector, in the housing association sector, the bill that's, that is attached to that is about 40 billion pounds. So before you even build new stuff, you've, you've, you've actually got a lot, of, a lot of inbuilt expenditure. So that adds to the overall, um, uh, uh, I, I, I suppose, the, the, the breaks on, on new supply. You asked, you asked whether we needed more homes. Um, you, you, you can go back to the Barker report, I suppose. You land as much more of an expert than, than I on uh, matters pertaining to Kate. But I think household formation rate, and um, we need to build somewhere between 200, 250,000 homes a year. To be fair to the Conservatives, um, I'll, I'll ignore the sort of the repurposing um, commercial buildings in a not very good way, typically. We're building 220, 230,000 new homes a year at the moment. That's getting, that's pretty good. It's getting about as good as it has been. But we haven't been doing that for a long time. So there's a, still a lot of catch up to go because people are still getting divorced, essentially, is, is one of the bigger issues. And people are, people are li living longer and using space less, less effectively. Um, you, you talked about my role in house in. Uh, funding housing associations, and we do 40-year mortgages in the wholesale market at two and a quarter percent, which is you know it, it, it's very very low cost of cost of funding. So there is a very efficient funding model out there. Um, I would guess someone might ask us about the David Miles question and and retail long mortgages. We're we're not really touching on the mortgage financing market here, and I I work with the building society as well as working with housing associations, but we have an industry that is hooked. I mean, it's, it's a broker-introduced market for mortgages completely now, and they're all hooked on two, three, five-year products. So there is a lot of inbuilt resistance in the overall supply of mortgages to doing longer-term mortgages. Um, I work in a different market where the tradition of 30-year loans, 30-year fixed-rate loans, has always been it's been there since um, uh, David's forebears cr created private finance for housing associations in 1988. We were borrowing on a 30-year fixed rate basis then. It was a heck of a lot more expensive at that point. It cost 12% to get a 30-year mortgage then. It now costs cost 2%. So there, there are some big, big questions about this, the, the um, both the concentration of mortgage supply. I'm, I mean, what? Uh, uh, Lloyd's, when it took over Halifax, had 25% market share, I think, off the top of my head, as a single entity. Um, there used to be 140 different building societies when I started working in the city. Um, there are now, I think it's 43, and of those, about half of them lend under a billion pounds each. My organisation lends seven and a half billion quid on, on, on its own. So, We've got a very, very concentrated market in terms of the supply of mortgages. 
uh, out there, um, albeit that it's actually quite competitive. So with, with that ma major provisor, um, I think that's probably all, all I want to say. Well, it certainly sounds personal to me. I'm living in a building with a cladding problem. I'm divorced and I hope to live for a lot longer than I do now. So uh, I'm taking all of this personally. Uh, Les, uh, tell us what you, I mean, you're a, not only a professor of statistics, but you're an expert in demography. And it's demography that to some extent drives the demand for housing. Les Mayhew. Good. OK, well, thank you very much, everybody. There was so much that I agree with listening to everybody. I, um, the, some of David's points about downsizing and uh, building units for older people with uh, care facilities attached are very close to my heart because um, the last thing I did with CFS, CSFI was exactly on that uh, topic. And it, it kind of fits very well with the, the way the demography of the country is going because obviously we're an aging population, but we're also a growing population. There's going to be well over 70 million people by 2040. And, you know, if you, if you want to play the sort of numbers game on this, then uh, Piers is, is right. Uh, you need 200,000 to 250,000 uh, homes a year to feed that stock. But for a couple of reasons, not, not just because of the population, but also because households are getting smaller and smaller. And over uh, the last 40 years or so, the average has gone down um, very considerably. So I'll throw out another statistic here. If we were had the same levels of occupancy in 1980, we would need something like 1.3 million fewer homes today than um, we have. So that's one point. Uh, the second point is that um, these households are getting smaller because the population is ageing and the uh, post 50, 55, 60 kids leave home and the parental home uh, is uh, stays with the parents and they often have one, two, three surplus uh, bedrooms. Now, if you could turn some of those um, uh, build back um, homes that would uh, suit those people, which would be more age friendly and meet all the criteria that David was uh, talking about, then I've estimated that you'd need to build something like 50,000 fewer homes every year, such is the scale of the problem. Something like 700,000 people turn 65 every year, which is a, a phenomenal, it's like a, a tidal wave sort of moving through the housing market. And, and it's helpful, I think, to sort of rise up in your helicopter sometimes and think about those um, big numbers. And, and so I think that, that building or changing the, the, the size and the quality of housing for older people is just as important as building new houses for people trying to get on the housing ladder. And in fact, that process would be much easier if you could um, solve that uh, downsizing problem in the best uh, possible way. Um, I wasn't this is the last time buyer rather than the first time buyer and we wish that we had more political traction in Westminster. Oh absolutely and I simply can't understand what what statistics some people are looking at not to be able to see that process ongoing and I suspect it's because they just they're fixated on the short term rather than the next 15 or 20 years. I mean there's so many interesting statistics in this area People are staying in their homes for something like 20, 23 years now. And it used to be, uh, the turnover used to be much, much lower 10, 15 years ago than it is today. And that speaks to the cost of moving house and various other things. Um, I know we're not talking about house prices, but I do want to say something about affordability because Piers touched on it as well. Back in 1980, because I've been looking at a very long time span here, 1980 to 2040, interest rates were gigantic, you know, 10, 12, 13 percent if you wanted to take out a loan. Now they're much, much smaller, um, one, two percent if you go to the right, right sort of places. And when you look at the, the data on housing costs, it's, it's still the case that you spend something like 30 percent of household income on financing those housing costs, whether it's renting or, or buying. Obviously, it's more if you're your private renting, which I could also say something about. But anyway, sticking to house buying. Now, th this is really important because um, 
the only way that people can afford to buy houses today is because the interest rates have gone down to such a less level and that that 30 percent of your household income is still roughly the the standard that that you see and uh, the, the big big issue it seems to me is that that First-time buyers are finding it ever more difficult to pay, save for a deposit. So house prices have gone up, obviously. So it takes years more to save for a sufficient deposit to buy one of these more expensive properties than it used to. And I do wonder whether the government is doing enough in its schemes to actually support that, support those first-time buyers in getting onto the housing ladder. So I think that's a, a really interesting point as well. The other thing that's made it easier, and I think Piers touched on this as well, my son, for example, who's trying to buy a place in South uh, West London, has been offered a 40-year mortgage, 40 years. So he's age 30. That makes him 70 years old when he's finished paying it off. Um, I don't think pension age will be 70 by 2040, but who knows. But in any case, it bumps into that last phase of your life where you hope to be rid of all those kinds of housing debts and so on. And I, I can't see how this story ends really because interest rates can't go much lower, can they? And um, house prices therefore can't go much higher either. So there must be some sort of plateauing or collapse imminent at some point in the future. I'm not quite sure when. One, one interesting demographic fact is that the baby boomers will be dying out in the next 10 years. Huge surge of births, you know, from about 1947 to 1950. Uh, they're all living longer, but they all got to die at some point. And the uh, demographic projections show that this will occur in the mid 2020s. And it, it's not a trivial point because the number of deaths each year, putting COVID completely to one side, will be up by around a third compared with the with the average, so that means instead of um, uh, uh, what is what is it, six hundred thousand dying, twenty thousand, eight hundred thousand. So anyway, it's a it's a large number, and that's going to free up a lot of uh, properties as well. And I mean, just just to conclude on on this point, I really do think we need to get a grip of of the changing demography, demography and household structures to really be able to understand what. Um, how we how we're going to live in the future and what we need to be building. We shouldn't just react to, uh, you know, the, the political whims that you know young people can't get on the housing ladder. We've got to think of it holistically across the whole piece. Okay, I would very much like to emphasise Les's point about the last time buyers. If we could make it easier for people to easier and cheaper for older people to downsize to accommodation that's more appropriate to their needs, it would ripple down through the housing market and would be a cheap, easy win for any government that chose to look at older people rather than at younger people. The impact is going to be on younger people just as much as it is on older people. Jane, what do you take away from what you've heard? Um, well, I, I'm really glad that we've covered the demographic issues. Um, I'm, I'm also uh, glad that, um, including downsizing, um, and uh, actually one issue that was touched upon was, was green belts, which perhaps um, we could hear a little bit more about. Um, but also, um, it's very interesting to hear a Conservative talking very openly about the proper balance between public sector and private sector. And if you want to achieve policy goals, um, you may not just be able to leave it to market forces, and, and that opens up the whole issue of uh, uh, what, um, whether rents are subsidised or whether there's grants for afford affordable housing and, and quite how you do this. Um, and actually, so what, one of the things Yolanda said um, about neighbourhoods and things um, means that you also have to look, of course, at in infrastructure and how that's financed. And we're, we're hearing, obviously, a lot about big infrastructure projects, whether it's HS2 or whatever. Um, but actually, this begs the question about local infrastructure, whether it's, you know, access to the A3 or, uh, you know, where, wherever you are, we can all think of things where if only that was improved, um, then there could be more housing without causing all the concerns about congestion or parking or whatever that uh, are constantly brought up. 
Well, let me ask David on that. I mean, in the latest Rishi Sunak's latest package, there was a small infrastructure fund, I think, of four billion pounds for precisely the kind of um, investments that Jane is talking about. But I also took away this rather interesting idea that what you were saying sounded well, not exactly socialistic, but not not down the line Thatcherist. Uh, David Simmons. I think the question is, what's the advantage ultimately to the taxpayer? And I think we've learned, uh, and, and I experienced this firsthand in my very early days. I went on from planning to chairing a social services committee in the days when um, the care acts of the Tony Blair government um, led to a, a wave of outsourcing of adult residential social care um, in order to get capital funding into the provision of those units um, of a, a type that met the new standards. And it's things like um, residents having to have access to their own private bathroom, um, which many existing uh, residential care homes simply could not do. So, and, and the consequence of that, we saw probably a decade or so afterwards, was the, the collapse of companies like Southern Cross, um, which you know, had started out as, you know, in many cases, small family run, moderately profitable, profitable care homes that had been agglomerated into much larger units that were then bought out. Um, and the, the, the structures behind them tended to be um, offshore arrangements whereby um, the money that made that capital investment possible was lent at, you know, interest rates, maybe five or six times the prevailing market rate from one part of the company to another part of the company in order to reduce their profitability. And in due course, they, they, the way they sought out of it essentially was to say to the taxpayer back to local authority customer, unless you're willing to, to accept a 20, 25% increase in your fees, um, we're just not gonna be able to provide you with the service anymore. And, and that kind of crisis was only averted really at great taxpayer expense. And I, I'd be very wary of us ending up with a similar situation in the housing sector, whereby you know, we find particularly at the, the acute end of provision for homelessness, that you know, what is currently a, a very diverse range of provision from all kinds of different landlords ends up, has happened with adult residential social care, has happened with children's residential social care, is provided essentially by a, a small number, sometimes even a single type of provider, who is therefore in a position where they can demand whatever cost, uh, whatever fees they want from the taxpayer. Uh, and in my view, that is simply not an acceptable position uh, for us to get into. So I don't think it's a matter of you know, market bad, um, state action good, that the state has a duty to protect the interests of taxpayers. Well, can I ask both Yolanda and, and Piers to respond to that? Yolanda first. Oh, goodness me. Um, so many thoughts have occurred, occurred to me, but to try and sort of tie, it, tie everything together. Uh, I, I do worry about uh, when we, I think it's, it's admirable that we're talking about demographics, because the more I look at it, the more, you know, uh, not just the housing market, but, uh, but uh, real estate generally is driven by uh, so much by demographics. But if we uh, equate an aging population with a need for specialist sort of care homes or uh, elder care facilities, um, I think we're, we're missing uh, something really important. There's, um, I wrote a, a few years ago about NORCs, uh, which is a, an American term, a North American term, which is, stands for naturally occurring retirement communities. And what you find is that a um, whole generation of baby boomers, which do, it, it does extend to 1964, I think. Right? Um, so we're not all dying off yet. Um, but... <laughs> I, yeah, I can't hear you, unfortunately, Rita. Um, Be careful what you say. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so, just said there was more than one baby boom, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah point, point taken. But uh, you know, this this large cohort, it, it would appear certainly the younger, the, the second sort of a boom, as it were, um, is 
is looking for very, very similar sort of neighborhoods and accommodation as, uh, as the millennials were. I think the millennials are increasingly wanting family homes and that's a, a ma major, thing. so the private rented sector is now having to adapt to uh, aging um, millennials, if you like, who are requiring single family homes rather than multi-family housing. So I think that's, that's quite an important trend. But when it comes to, to, to the older cohorts, don't anticipate that the downsizing is going to be to single age sort of homogenous uh, communities, um, multi-generational communities and good neighborhoods are just are is in as high demand from older people as they are for, from younger. And I think I think we've got to think it very much more, even when we're talking about care home sort of settings, that very much more mixed age um, neighborhoods or even even buildings. And I think um, this it, I, I keep coming back to neighborhood because it also ties in with the the problems that we ha have had in building so many apartments uh, to be blunt um we tend to build uh, apartments due to all sorts of quirks of regulations which i won't go into in what i call massive buildings some sometimes we build tall but i'm not just talking about towers i'm talking about the communally um well, the, 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 the problem of, uh, of massive buildings because of the amount of communal space, uh, service space, lifts and so forth, which, as Piers said, really adds to the costs of maintenance and upkeep. And I think these service charges, whether they're in specific elder care settings or the population more generally, are going to become a huge drag on value and a huge burden to erstwhile um, owner occupiers, even if they have been able to afford mortgages. I think we're going to hit a stage where for some people in certain circumstances, it's going to cost more to hold a property uh, than, your, than your, uh, the benefits you're, 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 you're getting out of it. So I think this whole issue of service charge maintenance uh, sort of further fe uh, fuels that obsolescence and depreciation point that I made earlier on and will have to be grappled with at, uh, at some point. Um, so I, I, I would reiterate, you know, how, mu how much cash is there going to be available for building new stock, given that, it, you know, the drive for unit numbers have, has driven us into some pretty unsustainable situations with existing stock. Okay, can I just go back to uh, ask Piers to, to go back to the point that David raises about the ultimate thing being the cost to the taxpayer here, and that we should, if you like, be agnostic on uh, on many of the other issues. The, the important thing is, given, however, what Yolanda says about the, the importance of community, uh, the, the whether this is public, private, or a hybrid, a mix of, of, of one or the other. What's, what's your view on that? Um, if I can, if I can phrase it in a very slightly different way, Andrew, the old-fashioned political dogma used to be um, home ownership equals conservative, public housing equals labour. I, I think we're moving beyond that now, and and there are there are signs that there are say politicians are waking up and, and and smelling the coffee. Elsewhere in this conversation, we've talked about the very long-term nature of mortgages that young people are having to take on. Les's point about your son who's got a 40, being offered a 40 year mortgage. The nature of employment is changing very, very much so. Let, let, you know, forget about furlough. If, if we hadn't got, hadn't got COVID, young people are going to go through five or six jobs. They're going to go through, through, um, through um, what are they called side hustles, aren't they? Sort of more, more than one job, more than one job at once. The, the, the old fashioned idea of having a 25 year mortgage and one employer is, is, is dead, really. So, the, but, but I suppose the elephant in the room where we are today that we all have to grapple with is, and it's been referred to once already, is are we on the edge of another correction? So, uh, as in a price correction, sorry, Jane. Um, so, Politicians are grappling with affordability and how to get people into home ownership at the margin. We've got a 10% shared ownership product that, that is hitting the street. But the amount of a correction it takes to knock that person's equity out and then some is not very, very much at all. Having just lent them for 40 years or you know, very, 
very long-term basis, and they're working in the gig economy. So the nature of how you get into the home ownership market, if you are not able to borrow from the, 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 um, the, the bank of mum and dad, it's quite a precarious place to be. And I, th- I think more and more politicians are recognising this and therefore having, sustain- and having sustainable um, rental product out there at the same time. We've got a formative institutional PRS, not private rented sector market, that's been encouraged by the, 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 current, the current government. I, I mustn't utter the phrase rent control, but fundamentally having a more sustainable rent product out there where people can feel they can, they can live in rented accommodation for a longer period and get their children to the school that they want to go to and so on. We're, we're getting much more into a mixed economy of all of those sort of, sort of places. What does a responsible conservative government with a working majority looking at the problems of the housing market and the, re- the issues that have been raised by all the speakers today, what does that government really do in the housing sector over the next three or four years as we emerge from COVID? I think the last word should be with you, David. That's extremely, extremely generous. What, what does the government do? I think first thing comes back to this point about what is the purpose of government activity in this field? Um, and the, the neighbourhood's point, I think, is a very well-made one. We can talk about it as leadership of place, placemaking. There's lots of different ways to describe it. But what sort of places are we trying to make available for our people here in, in England and in the UK to live? And the sub-question to that, what kind of units are required specifically? Is it just build as much as you can because price is the one factor that we're addressing? Or are we going to think about how the provision of additional types of family homes or downsizing homes interacts with the rest of the the sector to create supply? So I think that's that's the first thing. And I think the second part is particularly crucial because of its political deliverability. If we just focus on building enormous tower blocks, we'll get some of the units, but it's not going to result in the kind of change in the housing market that we want to we want to achieve. Second thing that the government, in my view, needs to do is it needs to be very robust in challenging some of the, the vested interests that, you know, I'm no objection. I think it's good for there to be profit-making private enterprises, and they are unquestionably part of the solution. But the reality is that the large house builders have not remotely come close to delivering the homes that we need. I agree completely understand why. It's not in their interest to do so. It's in their interest to be able to bring them to market at a particular price in order to maintain their profit margins. And it's just as it's in their interest to maintain a certain um, portfolio of of land with increasingly detailed levels of planning permission because each uplift in the value goes on their their balance sheet ultimately. And all of that is is just part of them running a good business. And that's all fine, but that's irrelevant to the question of what it is that the government's trying to achieve. And if the government is trying to achieve that greater supply of units, then it needs to be prepared to challenge some of those interests, both the entry of new financial organisations. We need to just be wary of the risks that some of that behaviour um, may provoke. But also we need to make sure that uh, in the way that we, we get things built, that we do it um, respecting things like um, the ability of local authorities to raise finance from their housing revenue account surpluses, rather than, um, than perhaps just relying upon um, the existing portfolio of providers. Okay, look, on that happy note, can I thank David in particular for his contribution? He obviously has to run. It's a great pleasure, and I'd have loved a longer conversation. It's just my vote is going to be required at a committee shortly, so I'm going to have to step away for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I thank Yolanda? Can I thank Piers? Can I thank Les? And, of course, my colleague Jane Fuller and all of you for watching. Many thanks.